Our text this morning is going to come from Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. And today's title is called Children and Parents in Christ. Let's read the word. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears and our hearts to be able to receive your words. And Lord, I just pray that it may plant seeds in us that may sprout fruit. And Lord, may you teach us, O Lord, what it means, O Lord, to be parents in you and also to be children in you, O Lord. And I pray, O Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be holy and pleasing to you. I pray that, Lord, that your gospel may be preached and your Holy Spirit may stir in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as you guys heard from last week, um, I was I said I was going to go back to the beginning of Ephesians 6 because last week I kind of jumped ahead to talk about spiritual warfare and the funny thing is, or maybe it might not be too funny to you guys, I, I thought I'd conclude our Ephesians series today by talking about children and parents and also the next few verses that talk about slaves and masters, um, only to really, um, after researching and meditating, I realized that if I was going to preach on both, I would be up here for over an hour on two separate subjects. And the idealistic side of me, I was like, yo, but people love sermons, you know, like, why not give them two? Like, they, they love hearing God's word. It's like, a double scoop of ice cream, right? Like, it's the more the merrier. No? But the realistic side of me actually kicked in. Um, it's a little bit stronger. And knowing that you guys will probably start zoning out in the, in the next 30 minutes and start squirming around, it's more like trying to feed your kids healthy vegetables or whole grain food, you know? And, and so, like most good things in life, I think it's better to give it in manage, manageable chunks. So, I'm actually going to get back to Ephesians just for one last sermon when I come back in October. So, just one sermon, and then we're going to go into a new one. So, just keep that in mind. So today we're going to focus on what Ephesians has to talk about on the relationship between children and parents. And later when I get back, we're going to talk about how also our relationship with Christ and how it affects our workplaces. I mean, these are, I think, two very important um, themes that I, I didn't want to kind of skimp out on. So I'm going to focus on it. Um, Three weeks ago, you guys know that we talked about um, the calling of husband and wives in the family and how that reflects our relationship with Christ. Today, we're jumping into um, children and parents and how that also reflects our, 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 our relationship with God. And today's the extension of that and how that identity in Christ begins to shape the family life. And I know that this topic alone is a huge interest to many of you guys in this room because a lot of us are in the thick of parenting in different stages of life, right? I mean, over the past two years, we had so many births going on, and you guys have witnessed it through, I don't know, infant baptism, and and we know that more children are to come, and I, I have a feeling that even more will come after that. Some of us are transitioning into our teenage years while others are, are getting them out of your house now that they're they're graduating. And, and, and I know some of you guys aren't married as well. You don't have children. And please don't think that today's sermon is, is irrelevant to you. Um, because first off, it does prepare you for the future. And if not that, we're all sons and daughters of somebody. And most of our parents, I do believe, are living. And, and Paul gives us wisdom for that as well. Now, preaching about the family is pretty taboo in our culture. I know it is. Many people, I think maybe in your heads, as this topic is going on, you're probably like, you got to mind your own business. This is my personal life. Stay out. While others from other cultures, actually members members of our church that are from Nigeria, they actually told me that parenting is not just done by the biological parents, but actually a whole community parents. Like, like if, I, you know, if I'm there, I could yell at their kids and it'd be totally acceptable. And I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, it's pretty cool. But I know situations are, are different and people are different. Cultures are different. Therefore, we have to be wary about laying down principles if it's not stated in God's word specifically. And I think Paul was aware of this when he's writing this part of the letter. 
I mean, he doesn't go into details of how that relationship is played out. He doesn't give us a list of things to do as if he's writing a, like a mommy blog and, and, you know, people who usually write a bunch of stuff where they think they know what they're doing, but a lot of us, we don't. And, and maybe it's because Paul was never a parent himself or he was never married, who knows? And you, you start to think, like, what makes him credible to even talk about this? But it's possible. It's because he understood that those details can always vary. And he's wise enough to leave them out. I mean, he doesn't talk about sleep training or, or methods of discipline or, or even education or even correct nutritional values that we got to feed or, or breastfeeding or any of that. But he, but he talks about a few principles, a few principles, even going back to the Ten Commandments. And he appeals to God's authority and design that he created people with, along with the understanding that this relationship of children and parents are another God-given means of understanding our relationship to, to God as our Father. See, just as husband and wives and that relationship reflects our relationship with God, the parent and child relationship further points to and reflects the relationship that we have with God. So this calling associated with being a son and a daughter of someone is also, is also, and, also and also the calling of being a father and mother of someone in its very design is there for a purpose to understand God's love for us. And I'm going to jump in. There's actually a lot of information here, even though this, these verses seem very short. But let's jump right in. In verses 1 through 3, it says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. First off, I want to point that Paul is recognizing that obedience of children is right. The obedience of a child and their submission to parental authority is not something that hurts the child. It's connected with the promise that's there so that things may go well. You know, automatically, when I was reading this, I was like, I started to think back to my youth, you know, and, and my mom saying a lot of stuff growing up to me. And I was like, oh, man, if I would have listened, I would be a pro piano player right now, a pro piano player. I would probably be a few inches taller because I would have ate right, drank my milk and, and all that. But, you know, I put a lot of garbage in my body when I was younger. So therefore, I am what I am. And so I could kind of understand. But this word right that Paul is pointing to, he's talking about a universal ethic right now. He's talking about a standard to building a healthy family extended into building a healthy society. And this is across all cultures of all time, regardless of religion or even distinct values. See, when Paul is talking about it, when he uses the word right, people automatically understood what that meant. It meant something divinely appointed, something that just happens and is bestowed upon all people. Paul, regardless of the Roman world or the Jewish world or even the Greek world, he, he affirms it, saying that it's right. And it's not hard to imagine why this is the case. Assuming that the parents have the best interests of the children in mind, and we're going to get to that soon, it's utterly important for them to learn to listen to their parents because kids will more often than not not make the right decisions for themselves. I mean, Lord knows, or Lord, if I left my daughters to create or choose their own meals every day, I know what it's going to be. It's going to be ice cream, cookies, and Doritos every meal, like every meal. Like my kids will starve to eat that type of food. Or if I let my one-year-old walk wherever she wanted without guiding her and at times yelling at her to avoid the street or to run around the parking lot, it will certainly not be good. You know, but more than that, more than that, it's also talking at a moral level. See, if you guys ever watch children play and you don't give them any rules or guidelines or anything, it's going to most likely be the, the biggest child with the loudest voice or the smartest one up to that point or the physically big one who will most likely hoard all of the nice toys while leaving the little ones to, to fend for themselves. I mean, you see this if there's no guidelines. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like the political world, right? Like, this is what happens. And now some of you might be like, no, my kid's not like that. Well, it's probably because you taught them better. There's a, but there's a deep theological reasoning why parents are told to have authority and it's a principle it's not a principle for the sake of the principle itself but there is a biblical biblical theological purpose behind it and it's a reality that all people have that we have to notice see the bible is not shy about talking about a sinful nature that is inherent in all people over and over again the bible talks about the reality of sin and the reality of evil that we even talked about last week now might 
it might help to go back to the first children of the world. And we can go back into Genesis to actually read about this, right? Right, right off from the bat, Adam and Eve, the first humans, have their first sons, Cain and Abel. And, and, and they're first showing us the first children's rivalry. And I think God is pointing to a deep reality of, of children or the human nature right from birth. The younger son, Abel, gets more recognition for his work. You know, he, he has more, he shows more sacrifice to God. Uh, and and, and, and when, when he notices that, Cain gets a little bit jealous. And what do we see? He kills his brother. He kills his brother. And for those of you who have more than two children, you can see this on a less dramatic scale. I mean, just the other day, I was cuddling Joy, my, my second child. I mean, she's getting so cute these days because she's trying to talk and do all of that. And I'm like, I'm like just loving her and like smooching her, holding her. And at the corner of my eye, I, I, catch, I catch Sophie just staring at us like with a disgusted look like, what the heck are they doing? And the next thing I knew, I dropped Joy off and, and, and they're both like on the couch. And I went out the other room and then I hear a big thump. And Sophie kicks Joy off the, off the couch and she's just on the ground crying. Now, that's not to say that all children are nothing but evil. Well, at least most children, right? Children are beautiful. They have good in their hearts. They're made in the image of God. But that goodness is always tainted with evil tendencies of real sin and that cannot be ignored. So if your children are acting up, they're disobeying and extremely selfish, they're, fought, they're fighting, they're lying out of their teeth already at a very young age, it's not because you failed as a child. It's because that's what people naturally do. And it's the reason why God has placed you in their life. And, 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 and it's a reality that we have to recognize and harness. And, and that's why we're called to discipline. And it requires the obedience of our children. And that's a blessing for them. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. I mean, Lord knows we're not. We make a lot of mistakes. But you know what's really interesting? A psychologist named um, Stanley Hurwitz, he, he put it like this. He, it was very interesting. He says, a mother and father might be wrong. They might be wrong. And this is a guy that's not even talking in a Christian context. He said they might be wrong to use their authority to teach their children something misinformed. And maybe the child will grow up and decide that they were wrong. But if the child grows up with the notion that nothing matters in life, this is far, far more dangerous. The refusal to ask our children to believe as we believe or to live as we live or to act as we act is a betrayal of our God-given role. And this is what I'm adding. And it comes from a moral cowardice that is the fear of upholding what is good and opposing what is evil. See, this, this thing, I mean, this is, this is a calling that, that, that God is placing upon parents. But this, this so-called obedience is not an absolute thing forever. I mean, for those of you guys that have older children now, it doesn't mean that you can tell your kids to do whatever they want. They still have to obey. Um, it's not an absolute in the sense of, of two ways. One, it says obey your parents in the Lord. Um, and this in the Lord thing is first and foremost recognizing that obedience is given to a parent by God, uh, by God's authority given to them when the parents are under the authority of God. And two, two, um, children should not obey absolutely. I mean, therefore, children should not obey absolutely to the point where they're sinning against God. But the second part I didn't really catch. One commentator actually pointed out that the word, word for children used in the Greek is actually talking to younger children, those that are in the process of training. So this commandment for obedience is not directly applied in the same way to an adult, and, and adult sons and daughters who are no longer under the care of their direct parents. This is pointing out, this is actually pointing to something real, that the parents' role in that type of authority is given just for a moment in time to raise them up as, as adults to be able to make their own decisions, and hopefully we give them a good foundation. And this commentator pointed out that the reason why the Ten Commandments doesn't say obey your parents, but he goes on in our text, it says, rather honor your father and mother. And the reason why he sets that as the bottom line standard is because obedience is a subset of that, of that honoring of the parents to the kids. But honoring is something, something else. And he goes on and he says this. I'm going to actually read what he says. He said, the commandment doesn't say love your parents. It doesn't say trust your parents. It doesn't say admire and enjoy your parents. It doesn't even say obey your parents. But why? It's because to say love your parents in the same sense of feeling affection for them would be impossible in certain circumstances. Why? Because some parents are just not that good or they're sometimes they're evil. And it would be wrong to feel or it would be stupid or wrong to feel affection for an evil person. And it also actually doesn't say to trust your parents. Why? 
because some parents are unstable. They're not trustworthy. To trust them in some cases would not be wise. And it doesn't say admire your parents because in some cases that would be impossible without denying the truth. It doesn't say obey your parents because the Bible wouldn't lay down as a, as a principle, as an a, a eternal, absolute rule, because our relationship with our parents changes. But he goes on to say, we're all called to honor our parents. Honor our parents. I mean, the other things are great if they come along the way. However, we are called to honor them, and that has nothing to do with our personal feelings or the worthiness of our parents to receive it. It's something we are called to give to them regardless of how we feel about them. And I guarantee this is going to be more important for us to grasp as we get older and our parents' cap capabilities begin to diminish more and more and some of you guys begin to think about your past and all the th different things that, that might have been bad. But honoring a parent means to give them recognition for who they are. Honoring your mother and father is, is being respectful in both word and action and not ignoring or forgetting them See, the Greek word for honor means to value. And, I, and when, he, when, when he says to give honor, it means to give value and recognition for who they are, not for what they are worth. And now that honor is played out in different ways for different people, culturally speaking. It's different with depending on our own abilities even, but it's a principle for us to wrestle with. We have to wrestle with this because we're commanded to find out how we are to honor them. And it's an active thing. And it's something that we have to continually look to do. We have to find out how to do it. Guys, I want to encourage you guys, you know, go home today. If you don't live with your parents, just give them a call. We we'll spend a day with them. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a first step. But the next part of our text, Paul is directly speaking to parents. And even more specifically, speaking to fathers. And the next reason, and I think the reason for, for the directed to fatherness is, one, because of kind of the guy nature and what he talks about next but also because fathers are called to set the tone for parenting as the head of the home. Verse 4 goes and says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, this is a calling for parents to recognize that their children are not their possession for them to manipulate to their liking, but children are individuals made in the image of God with their own wills and feelings and thoughts. They are people, and we're... We're, we're called to consider them that way. Now, first, Paul tells parents not to provoke their children to anger. In other translations, it actually says don't um, exasperate or don't infuriate. He's saying don't infuriate your children. And I was like, this is interesting. Don't, don't perpetually make your children angry. It's, but it's basically saying we have to be sensitive to emotions. What does this mean? One Greek, Greek expert, when looking at this phrase, he was like, you know, it's a common phrase that, that means don't excessively, don't excessively practice severe discipline or don't be unreasonably harsh or, or don't abuse your authority or, or don't be arbitrary in what you do or, or unfair or constantly nag or condemn or, or humiliate. He was like, don't be abusive. And Paul points to the importance of understanding the emotions of our, ch our children and uh, maybe this is directed to the fathers because a lot of times fathers, we, we work on principles or like they did wrong. We got to fix that. So we try to fix it regardless of the process. But I, I think Paul, Paul here is talking about, no, the process is important. We have to consider the feelings. We have to we have to do this in an effective way. And, you know, not too long ago, I met up with an old pastor. He was a friend of my father. And, you know, we meet every now and then. And he shared with me. Um, kind of with a sad face on his face, he was like, yo, you know, my daughters no longer see me. We were sharing prayer requests, and, and um, you know, you can, you, you, you can feel the, the shame in his voice, but he was like, hey, man, I, I have to get this off my chest. Can you, can you pray for me? And with the sadness of his eyes, he looked at me. He was like, you know, I only strive to teach him what was right. I only strive to teach him what was right. And I was like, in my head, I didn't say it out loud. I was like, man, maybe that was a downfall. I mean, he was a guy that would require his, his kids to be home at 5 a.m., 5 p.m. every day. I mean, I remember very strict, no activities. They were never allowed to go to prom, no dances, no nothing. No friends had to, like, be approved before they were able to make relationships. And if they didn't listen, I know he was harsh and he was very strict. But the thing is, right when they went to college, they never turned back, never turned back. And I remember they never turned back and they, they never wanted to see him. 
Yes, what's right and true is first and foremost important. I mean, you don't want to affirm bad things to your children for the sake of accommodating their feelings. Truth has to be taught. But where I, where I think this guy lacked was in doing more than that. I mean, it really is more than that. We're utterly emotional creatures, and we will not listen if our emotions are ignored. You know, I found this to be so clear even in the life of ministry. I mean, as a pastor, in my relationship with the congregation members, if I would ever hurt somebody emotionally, from that moment on, they literally can't hear me preach. Literally. Now, this is obviously doesn't mean that, that we're, we're never called to be um, disciplining strictly, but we need to know what's best for our children, considering their emotions, not provoking them to anger or that perpetual state. But on the flip side, under-disciplining is also provoking a child to anger. And I was listening to another pastor explain this out, and I was like, dang, that's so true. And he goes on to say to under-discipline your child to guide them and to be consistent with them. And, and, and if you're afraid of their disapproval and you always give in to them, then you're going to begin to raise a child who is utterly spoiled, and a spoiled child will always be angry. And I was like, wow. And he goes on, he said, think about it. Anyone with a great sense of entitlement grows up to be angry because when that kid goes into the real world, they're going to quickly find out that no one's going to pamper them, no one's going to listen to them or put up to their demands. They're going to be a, a, in a perpetual state of being, being, being frustrated and angered, and they're going to be angry at the world. So I think it kind of goes at both ways. Don't overdo it, but don't underdo it. The, fact, the second thing Paul talks about is he calls parents to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The calling of a parent is to disciple them to be individuals, to raise them into adulthood by instilling the values and the commandments and the message of God into their hearts so that they have an understanding of their identity in, as children of God. And this is a calling of all parents, along with teaching them to wash their face, brush their teeth, along with teaching them to talk, educating them with the basic functions in life, along with helping them with their homework. Our main, our main calling is to deeply plant deep roots of their identity as children of God, teaching them the truths of God mes God's message, the gospel that we have, God's heart, character, and commandments, and that's our calling. And I know right when I say this, um, there's going to be a handful of people that might not be that mature in their faith, and they automatically have things. They're like, isn't that indoctrinating our kids? You know, on Thursday, I was just working on a sermon at Starbucks when a random guy actually sat at my table. It was kind of a little bit bigger table. He sat down. And I was like, yo, can I sit down? And, you know, I was like, yeah, go ahead. And he was like, oh, what you up to? And I, was I just happened to be reading the Bible. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm reading the Bible. I don't know why I was, like, kind of shy about saying I was like, I'm just reading the Bible. And then he was like, oh, and, you know, he kind of did the, huh. And I was like, yeah, I'm actually a local pastor. And he was like, oh. And the funny thing is, he's a really, really outgoing guy. So, like, throughout our sitting together, he started writing questions on a piece of paper and slipping it to me. And I was like, oh, shoot, I guess God does open up moments of evangelism. I'm like, all right. So, you know, he talked about a bunch of things. I mean, like the philosophy of religion, like why you believe what you believe. And he kept slipping me these papers. I'm like, you can just ask me, man. But anyways, I'm happy because I have all those papers in my, in my bag now. But along the way, one of the things that he brought up, because as we we're talking, I was like, yeah, you know, I think it's good that we should dig deeper. And I was like, I, I applaud you for deeping deep, deeper into what you believe in, because um, his family was, it was Christian growing up. But what he said this, he responded by saying, he was like, you know, that's why I don't like churches and Christian parents that tend to indoctrinate their child, children by making them memorize Bible verses and sing songs uh, uh, of you know, like friends in Jesus. And I mean, don't you agree that we should allow them to make up their own mind as they get older to make more informed decisions? And I was like, listen to him. I was like, I was like, I can see where you're coming at. But, you know, maybe it was the Holy Spirit that came upon me. I was like, but don't you know indoctrination happens at all levels? I can see where he's getting at. And I can, I can understand if you don't believe that the words that we teach them are, are, are truths that are utterly important for a children's life, whether they understand it or not. But let me ask you guys, why do we teach our children anything? I mean, how about, how about why do we teach our children to brush their teeth? I mean, on the outside, it's pretty simple. You're like, yo, we don't want their teeth to be rotten. I mean, they have a second chance, but they don't get those habits. It's going to get ruined for life. We're like, we don't want that. We want to teach our Children, that, but let me ask you, does it matter if their kid understands the science behind bacteria or, or plaque and how that works in their mouth? 
I mean, it doesn't matter if they understand what fluoride is and what toothpaste company makes it most, more natural. I mean, they can find that all out later, but why do we teach them now? Why do we teach disciplines now? I mean, do we not teach them because they don't understand it? I mean, that's nonsense. Paul understood something. He understood that understanding who he is, who God is, and understanding who we are, and understanding the sinful tendencies, sinful tendencies of ourselves, and knowing our need for salvation, and, and, and relying upon God's commandments, the moral laws written in them, those foundations are utterly, utterly important for a child, and also for society. See, Paul for Paul, this was more concrete than science. Paul was an educated man, knowing the history of his own people. He saw the rise and fall of other, other, other cultures and other, other generations of the past. I mean, he was a very educated man, knowing the entire Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. But Paul's calling us, have that same confidence that we're called to have. That's the same confidence that Paul's calling us to have in raising our children. Do we believe that God created this world and knows what's best for us? Do we truly believe that life on earth is not the end? And if anything, just a slither of the rest of life, a piece of sand in the greater eternity, how can we not begin to invest in the longer-term blessings of the child by teaching them the things of God? And the truth is, indoctrination of our children will happen regardless. You know, I don't think people realize how easily influenced a person is. A human is wired to be indoctrinated. You guys don't believe me? Let, let me, let me, let me tell you one thing. You guys ever think about language? Language just in and of itself has culture and value planted into it. For one, I grew up speaking Korean, the Korean language. But did you guys know that the very structure of the Korean language is built into a hierarchical system of recognizing who's above you and who's under you? So before you talk to anybody, you have to categorize somebody. Are they above me or under me? Then you speak the formal language to the above or the younger or the equal one you can speak lower to. And you're taught to categorize people early on. You don't find that in the English language. See, indoctrination begins with the very language we teach them, the culture of a country that they grow up in, the city that they live in. Most likely, all your kids are going to be, be, be Eagles fans. Well, hopefully, you guys indoctrinate them to do that. Like, no Cowboys fans, please. And on the similar level, a family culture, for better or worse, indoctrinates a child. The news that they read, the books that they read, they're indoctrinated by what's on TV, what schools they go to, what teachers that they have, the friends that they have, what favorite movie star says what about anything. They get indoctrinated. To say we shouldn't indoctrinate our kids is assuming that they can avoid it. We're all indoctrinated. The question is, then, what, then what's more important, right? It's not about not indoctrinating our kids, but it's a matter of what you will teach them. What are you going to teach them? Are you going to teach them based on a documentary that came on last year that talked about the new, new hip thing or indoctrinate them based upon what a few doctors said about a new finding, you know, or indoctrinate them on some new, new psycho psychological method that worked on a small group of kids in an isolated case study in a different country? You know, many times we find so, many, so much of that being wrong just after a decade. You know, a, a funny or maybe sad story is my cousin actually followed a method of, of giving her children only soy milk instead of cow milk when that became the new popular thing. And she was like, I said, it's all soy from here and, and, and nothing. And that became the, the new popular health breakthrough only to find out like a decade later that they, they found out soy milk was on, the kids that drank soy milk was on average shorter. And it's not that good for your health. It was filled with hormones and all this stuff. And I'm not that, an expert on this. Uh, and I'm not naive to believe that's the only factor, but her, her kids are really short. But things always change, always change. Even on a statistical standpoint, the world has recognized the values and truthfulness of what is taught in Scripture, and it has found to be timeless, even outside of our faith, where even if parents are not fully convinced of their faith, they tend to go back to church because they know it's good for their kids. Why? Let me tell you. If God's word is true, then it's not just good for your kids. The Bible is not there to simply teach them a good life. But it's the very message and truth that gives them new life, a real life, an eternal life, a life with a definite purpose and an unshakable foundation that will strengthen them to face anything that comes in life. It's their salvation. And there's nothing, nothing more important. You know, therefore, this is the calling of parents to do this. 
both in our example that examples that we show for a lot of the things that are, are, are caught rather than taught, right? They're caught rather than taught. Our character, our devotion, our faith is at times the only Bible that the kids truly understand. And we're also called to teach the instructions of the Lord, his commandments, his stories, and all the testimonies of Scripture. Deuteronomy 11, 18 to 21 says this. It's going to be on the screen. It says this. You shall bind therefore, there, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on, sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to you, to your fathers, to give to them as long as the heavens are above the earth. I mean, Paul's talking about you, know, you got to read the Bible together. You got to pray together. Have Bible verses written on the walls. You know, I still remember in my youth, my mom used to put up Bible verses on the wall. I didn't like it, but I just kept them up because I felt like God would punish me if I take them off. So I left them on. But I would read them time and time again at different points of my life, and it would speak to me. And now what does this all have to do with being a child and a parent in Christ? Everything. See, in Christ, in God, we see multifaceted pictures of the entire family unit. See, Jesus, as the Son of God, was a perfect son who practiced per per perfect obedience and honor. Did you guys know that at the moment he was crucified on the cross or before it, he prayed on the mountain in the Garden of the Gethsemane, and he prayed to the Father saying, Lord, or God, Father, will you remove this wrath coming to me? But he followed up by saying, not my will, but your will be done. And he moves forward in love and obedience. And Jesus is also the perfect father. He is the head of the church, the head of believers, and he came to guide us to truth and a new life, coming down to our level so we can understand, giving us his spirit so that we may be taught truth. You know, Jesus wasn't shy about truth. He came calling people to repent. He rebuked the proud, but at the same time, he also cried with those who, lo cried with those who lost loved ones. He came and sat with sinners. He healed and fed the needy. And most of all, guys, through Jesus Christ, he humbled himself to become a human in order to enter into humanity, to speak our language, experience, experiencing our pain in our heart. And in that, he stepped into our shoes and gave us truth and salvation. Guys, the truth is, as children and parents in Christ, our faith, our faith in Christ is what allows us to honor our parents, is what allows us to love our children in a way where we can raise them up in faith. You know, um, there's a verse in Luke 14, 26, I should have had it up here, but I'm just going to read, read it to you guys because it's actually kind of has a shock value. And I think that's what Jesus was doing. But he had, Jesus actually says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know, when I first read this passage, I was looking at it like, what the heck is he saying? I got to hate my parents. I got to hate my kids. I got to I got to hate my brother and sister. It sounds like the opposite of what we've been learning up to this point. But I began to when I when I began to meditate and I, re I realized one, Paul, when Christ says hate, it doesn't mean to neglect or really hate. But it means to love Christ to the point that in comparison, all the other relationships aren't as valuable, almost to the point of hate. And the reason why he does this is because Christ knew that the only way we can really love is to put him first in our lives. Why? Because when Christ becomes your only source and your only love, you're now able to love others, not through your human love, but through Christ's love. You know how, how corrupt and uh, human love actually is? It's self-seeking. It breaks up all the time. But we have to receive love from God in order to give that type of love. And Christ wants us to break the patterns of this world and let him take over our relationships. And only in him do we find our strength to obey and honor our parents. Not looking to them, not seeing if they're worthy, but looking at them through the eyes of Christ and giving, giving them the honor through the lens of Christ. And only then can we even begin to parent. Not looking at our children, not loving them with our own love, but looking at them through Christ 
and seeing that they are gifts given to us by God for his purposes. And he's going to give us grace along the entire way, guys. Christ is both the parent of us and also our children. And he takes responsibility to the very end. It's all through Christ.